As we continue in our messages through getting a glimpse of God, we're going to be looking at God the Comforter. And he gives us a glimpse of him as a, a comforter through Habakkuk. Habakkuk is a, a good book for us to read because Habakkuk, he was full of questions. And his questions were very simple that all of us probably have asked. But the wonderful thing is this, God gives him answers. And when God can give you answers and you agree with those answers, it's amazing the things that happen. So Habakkuk went from questions with God to confidence in God. You ever been that way? I have. He is helping us to understand that when we have questions about our role, and all of us have questions about our role, God gives us the right direction. So you and I need to understand it's okay to ask. It's okay to have faith. And I believe what I call righteous faith is that, that I'm not asking the questions anymore. I'm just expecting the answer that God would like me to have. But there's nothing wrong with asking so how can we in a world that will cause any person to ask questions go to a place that we have confidence in God? And there lies the, there lies the issue. So many of us continue to question and question because we, number one is we're not confident ourselves, but then have confidence in God. He's the same yesterday, he's the same today, and forever. Now I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm not going to read all the scriptures because I'm basically covering every chapter in Habakkuk. I'm going to kind of give you a summary, and then I'm going to, we're going to go to chapter 3, verse 17 through 19, which is basically the answer, okay? So, do you ever have questions? Habakkuk, ask a few. In chapter 1, this is just a summary, moving through. God, why don't you answer prayers? He asked right away in verse 2. Verse 3, he says, so why, so, why so much sin? These are all questions we asked. Verse 4, why is justice not being upheld? Why? You're in charge. Why isn't things being upheld? Well, I guess he realized we have a free will. Verse 12, God, I, don't I figure out in your plans? Don't I fit in your plans, God? Verse 13, why do you let the wicked prosper? Wow. In verse 14, am I not special in your sight, God? Am I not one of your special children? Verse 15, should our people be ridiculed by godless people? He's talking about the people of Israel. Should they be? How about you and I, the Christians? We're being ridiculed right now because of this virus that's going on. We believe in practice of you know, faith. And it's been interesting how things have turned around to churches can't meet. Now churches can meet. And it's interesting that sometimes the church has to stand up for what they believe is right based on the freedom that we've received. Verse 15, should our people be ridiculed by godless people? No. In verse 16 and 17, will you ever punish the godless? Well, the answer, because we got the rest of the answer in the New Testament. Yes, he does punish the, uh, the godless. This man, Habakkuk, had some questions. So when you have questions and other people questions, you can say you're like Habakkuk. What interest me is how God took Habakkuk from questions to confidence. And I hope today you can see that in your life. I hope if you, you don't have it in your life, today's that day that you say, I desire to have confidence and quit asking all the questions. So how to get from questions about God to confidence in God? Well, the first way is through honesty. Through honesty. When you can be honest, first with God and second with yourself, it's amazing the things that can happen and the things that God can use us to do because of honesty. It's hard for Him to use us when we're lying. It's hard for Him to use us or, or we receive the blessing when we're not honest. Now, verses uh, in chapter 1, verse 2 through 4 and 2 through 17 tell us if we're going to go from questions about God to confidence in God, we must be honest. We must be honest in our questions and must be honest in the reception that we get. Habakkuk, Habakkuk was honest in freely expression. Habakkuk's honesty was freely expressed. He mixed it up with God. It's important that you and I understand that as we learn 
to follow the Lord, He does things for us. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm afraid we're a lot like this guy that came home drunk. His wife helped him in the door, put him in bed. He was real drunk. There he laid in the repentant mood, oh, I'm so sorry, that the wife said, do you want me to pray for you? He said, please do pray for me. So she started her prayers by saying, dear God, Jim lays here drunk. He stopped her and he said, could you just tell him that I'm sick? We're all that way. We're all that way and not being honest. We want us to always look better than someone else. And it's amazing today in our culture how much lies come out. And the sad thing is when you're caught in your lie, then it's hard for other people to trust you. Have you ever tried to snow God? Have you ever tried to, to the, in your prayers, be like Jim and just, oh, no, no, the truth is. So questions don't bother God, but dishonesty might. The second thing that Habakkuk was honest about was he, his, the way he expressed things to God. He went straight to God. Habakkuk went from honesty to patience. He went from honesty to patience. Now, number two, found in chapter two, verses one through three, we find out that Habakkuk went from one thing to the other. Before he could have this next thing, he had to have honesty. Then he began to have patience, it says in chapter two, verses one through three. I am in a hurry and God is not. Woo, we, we can all talk like that. God, why don't you catch up with me? Why aren't you ahead of me? Folks, I am in a hurry. God is not. Verse 1 of chapter 2 shows his patience when he says this, I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply. Let me say that again. I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may rely or reply. Verse 3 of chapter 2 the vision is for the appointed time. God gave the vision, but it was for an appointed time. It wasn't just for that time. Our behavior is influenced by our experience or our expectations. Are you aware that things just don't happen? You've done something. You've, you've been influenced either by an experience you've had or an expectation that maybe you have. So he went from patience to faith, and you and I need to understand if I'm honest and I'm patient, then I can have faith. In chapter 2, verse 4. Now, the principle of life is this. The principle of life is this. The righteous will live by faith. If you're righteous, you live by faith, knowing that God is in control. And faith is something I cannot see. I cannot put hands on faith. But I can believe because of things that have happened in my life, in your life. And it says the same thing in Romans chapter 1 verse 17 and Galatians chapter 3 verse 11. That the righteous will live by faith. Now faith and, and faithfulness in the Hebrew and the Greek came from the same root word, which is interesting. If you have a genuine faith, it will be exhibited in your faithfulness. If you have a genuine faith, you will see it in your faithfulness. You will have faith. You know, we fail so much in the church because we are people. We are humans. We have all kinds of reasons for not attending church. Either it's, it's inconvenient or I've been asked to go fishing or golfing or whatever it may be. And you and I need to understand that my faithfulness to God is because of my faith. And we need to realize the excuses God hears, but the excuses are made by you and by me. I love the following thoughts that Ruth Graham expressed in a book called It's My Turn. She said, I lay my whys before your cross in worship kneeling, my mind too numb for thought, my heart beyond all feeling, and worshiping, realizing that in knowing you, I don't need a why. Lord, I'm glad that you answer our whys even though we don't answer them, or even though we don't ask them. Point number four, he went from faith to prayer. Chapter three, verses one through two. He went from faith to prayer. So in your blank, it'd be prayer. 
verses, chapter 3, verses 1 through 2. So he went from prayer to meditation. He began to meditate in his prayer. He began to meditate on things. A lot of meditation I do is driving. That's dangerous sometimes because I forget that there's a sign here or I need to slow down because I'm thinking. I'm thinking and meditating with my eyes open, but sometimes when you got your brain over here and meditation is forget to stay focused. And we need to be able to do both of them. So he went from faith to prayer, and then he went from prayer to meditation. Chapter 3, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 9, chapter 3, verse 13. Look at the end of each of these verses, and you will see the word shila, S-E-L-A-H. It means to stop and think clearly, to stop and think clearly. So God wants us to look at this and think about the words he wants us to think clearly about what has been said. The word Sheila is used 71 times in the book of Psalms. So we're supposed to stop and meditate when that word is used. And it's used three times just right here in Habakkuk. So there's something important when he says that at the end of a sentence we're supposed to meditate upon. Three messages that God is saying to stop and think about. Listen to these. Three messages that God is wanting us to think about. As, and, and just be still for a moment. Number one, verses one through three in this chapter, chapter three. He says, revive, stop for a moment, think about what I have done for you. So revive, be revived by sitting and thinking about the things that God has brought you through, the things that God has given to you, the things that God is doing in your life. God wants to revive you, and you and I don't want to be revived. So we need to stop for a moment and think about what has been done in our life, and we can be revived in that because he hasn't forgot us. Verses 4 through 9 says that he, he brings us to a place in our life that we need to remember. So he revives, and he wants us to remember that God took care of us, that God took care of us. Never one time did he not take care of us. He may not have did it the way that we want it done, but he took care of us. And then chapter 3, verses 10 through 13, he restores us. So first he revives us, second he remembers us, and third he restores us to where he wants us to be. So he went from meditation to what we would call praise. Went from meditation to what we would call praise. Now, praise is a choice. I can praise the Lord, and a lot of people do it in a lot of different ways. I can just say, praise the Lord. I can clap and, and give God the honor. Uh, some people raise their hands. Some people stand up. Some people kneel. Now, in the Old Testament, the word kneel meant to show that he was mighty, that he was mighty. And so to kneel is a humble situation to where you give hum humility to him. It could be similar to bowing your head, showing humility to him. It could be prostrating yourself out on the floor and allowing God to speak to you by you just being quiet. There's all kinds of ways that we, you and I, can be still. And it's important that you and I understand that when we get still, God can begin to work on us in a mighty, mighty ways. Let me ask you a question today. You ever give him praise? You ever realize that he deserves our honor? He deserves our faith. He deserves our love in everything we do. We're going to doubt sometimes. We're going to be like Habakkuk. And, and, but we need to learn that God is our comforter. God is the one who gives you and I comfort that nobody else can give us. People try, and it's nice for Mama to comfort me, but you know what? It's nothing like God. And sometimes I'm comforted when I am praising Him, when I'm praying to Him. When I lay still and meditate, it's a way, it's amazing the strength I receive and what he does for you and what he does for me. Now, in, in, in chapter 3, he says this, in verse 17. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no fruit, though there is no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Folks, he's saying, I may have lost everything. There may not be the security that I want in my life, in my bank account, in my home. It may not be there. 
I may not have the car other people have or the home other people have, but he says, I've got to learn to realize that I will be joyful in my God who's my Savior. He's the one who makes it possible for me to be saved. And then it says in verse 19, the sovereign Lord is my strength. Think about it. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. And then he enables me to go on the heights. Think about this. There's three things that you and I need to understand that he gives us. And as we look at chapter 3, it's very simple what he gives us. And here's what it is. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my strength. I am weak, but he is strong. And when he is strong, I get stronger. My faith and my faithfulness shows me that I get my strength through him. In Psalms 23, he says, The Lord is my strength. The Lord is there for me. The Lord is there watching over me. He's my shepherd. And then he says that he does something for you and I so that we can become stronger. He lays us down in green pastures. He takes us through the valley of the shadow of death. He protects us with his rod and his staff, which are both defensive and offensive weapons. So you and I need to understand as we look at Abaca, that in, in chapter 3, the Lord is my strength. And next you see that he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. And man, can they move. There's very few animals that are as quick to move as a deer. And, and their brain and their eyes are tied into that feet. You ever watch a deer, he's constantly, he'll go down to eat or drink water, he's constantly looking up. And he constantly knows anything that's moved since he went down before because he has to have that built inside of him or he is going to be the prey of somebody and he'll be the dinner, the evening meal. So it says that he makes my feet like the feet of a deer. And that means I'm always going towards him. I'm always moving towards him. And then third, he enables me to go on the heights. What does that mean? To continue to grow in my faithfulness. He enables me. Everybody has the ability and the choice to have these in their life. He will enable me when I need to be enabled. He will enable me when I am strength, he, when I need strength and I'm weak. He will always be there to take care of the needs I have. And Abaca, remember, he started off with a lot of questions. And you and I are that way. God, why don't you answer my prayers? I prayed 40 years. 40 years for my oldest brother, who was 10 years older than me. Prayed that he would accept Christ. And to accept Christ, he needed to make some changes. Well, the day my mother died, I went to his house to help him unload a, a wheelchair that my mother used, a power wheelchair. Because he had had back surgery and needed something like that. And as we got that in his house, his son who helped us had, had to leave. He had to go do something with his children. And I said, oh Lord, what an what a opportunity I have right here. Driving over to, to where they were at, about 20 minutes from where my mother died at, I just said, Lord, this is an appointed time that you're giving me. It's been 40 years. So as we sat down in his living room, I looked at him and I said to my brother, if you died today like mom just died, would you be with God like mom's with God? He said, well, yeah, I guess. I said, but guess based on what? Well, because you're a preacher. I should be able to go to heaven too. Your brother's a preacher. I should be able to go to heaven based on y'all. And mom, she's a preacher. I mean, she's not a preacher. She's a Christian. And I said, well, you know, all that sounds good. And that's a, to me is, a, I'm not being mean, but that's a lie that someone has fed you. Because until you say, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son, the living God, and I take him as my Lord and Savior, you've not done what the Bible tells us to do with the great uh, confession. And you and I need to understand, do you really, have you ever made that confession? He said, well, no, I never made that confession. I thought I lived a Christian life. I said, well, so did Nicodemus. He had everything, but he did not turn it all over to God. And you and I have got to come to the place in our life that we turn it over to God and God gets everything from us. Then he allows us to use what we have. So my brother came to the place. He said the good confession. And as I walked out, his wife walked out with me. Her eyes were big, big. She said, I've been married to him almost 50 years. I never thought he would do this. 
And I said, you know, we've been praying for, 50, for 40 years. God's been working on him for 40 years. So I, here's what I tell you. Don't give up. Don't give up praying for people. Don't give up for caring. Because someday God can take the heart of the people you're praying for and he can change that heart because God is in control. He puts circumstances in our life and you need to understand he is in control. If you're listening to this message as we stream it out to all kinds of places, the question I have is very simple. Are you a Christian? And if you're not a Christian, why not? It's not as hard to make that confession, but it's hard to live it. But I can't live it if I don't make that confession and have God in my life and obedient to Him in Christian baptism where it says in Acts 2.38, I received the gift of the Holy Spirit, which is God living in me. Folks, I don't have enough strength and power on my own. It takes God making things happen. It takes God working in my life through my faithfulness to Him. So it's very simple. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I always do this after every message because there might be somebody that hears what's being said and has never made that simple confession. If you make that confession, communicate with me. Find a Bible teaching church. If you need to find out where one is, let me know, and I'll help you find one because God wants you now to follow through and to grow in Him and be faithful. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are our comforter. You are the one who brings us comfort when we have all the questions. Abaka had lots of questions. And I pray, Father, that like Abaka, as he meditated, he turned everything over to God and realized he gets his strength lies in God. And Lord, as we uh, close today, I pray that you would uh, give us peace that surpasses all understanding. We pray, Father, that we would want to make you Lord, because if you're Lord of our life, you're Lord of everything we have. You're Lord of all. Lord, we pray for our country. Pray for our president. Pray for our leaders. We pray for first responders in our communities, protection. We pray, Father, for these political people, these politicians, that you could enter their heart, to something could be said and done that will change their life to look to you and look to you in strength and in truth. Lord, bless the churches and our communities and also the commun- in, in every community that we're, we're touching We pray your blessings upon it. We pray you'd heal this virus. You can do it, Lord. I have faith. And I pray as you heal that virus, we will put our time and our strength in you. It's in the name of Jesus, which is the name above all names. And by that name, he can heal us, he can strengthen us, and he can give us one step of faith like he did Peter when he stepped out of that boat and walked. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.